Hi, this is David Allen Greer. This video is a summary of a talk that I gave at the Raytheon Innovators series. In it, I was asked to speak about the computer pioneer Alan Turing as an innovator. To do that, I decided to look at the context in which Turing worked, the environment of ideas that helped him build his contributions to computing, to code breaking, and to computer science. Turing is, of course, one of the key pioneering innovators in the field of computer science. He's also a very interesting character, and we've seen a couple movies made of his life in recent years. And so the questions we want to ask are, how did he see the future? How did he make that future work? And what do his ideas mean for you? In this talk, I was also asked to discuss what we would call his victimhood, but I would really like to put it, as well as all of his technical contributions, in a bigger context and use it to explore at least a little bit the challenge of technical leadership. And out of all of this, the fundamental question that I'm going to be asking is what is the relationship between context and insight? So if we're going to be looking at Turing's life as a story of innovation, we're going to be putting it in context, and we are going to be working on three distinct forms of context. The first will be the intellectual context, the world in which the new ideas were born, and how we have new ways of approaching knowledge in that context. The second will be the practical context, the kind of tools and abilities and skills people had to create new devices. And third, we will look at the contextual need, what problem needed to be solved. Now to understand these contexts, we're going to humanize them. We're going to look at three stories of three different people that will help us understand context. The first, the intellectual context, is the power of mathematical logic. And we will look at the story of David Hilbert to understand that. Next, we're going to look at the practical world, the value of machinery. And we're going to look at another mathematician, George Cantor, to help us understand that. And finally, the need, which is really the call of service to help protect and support and defend one's country. And we will look at John Curtis to help us understand that. But of course, our story is really about Alan Turing. And so we need to ground ourselves in his life. That life lasted from 1912 to 1954. He was a British mathematician, and in 1931, like many skilled mathematicians, he went to King's College at Cambridge in order to get his bachelor's degree. At the end of that period, in 1936, he published a paper called Computable Numbers, which was the first major contribution he made. And at some level, if that's all that he did, he would be considered an important mathematician to this day. He went from there to Princeton University in the United States, where he completed his doctorate. He returned to the United Kingdom in 1938, and between that year and 1945, he worked for the government as a code breaker at Bletchley Park. After the war, he worked both at the National Physical Laboratory for a few years, and then at the University of Manchester, and it was during this period that he created his first full working computer, which was called the Pilot Ace. It was built at the National Physical Laboratory. In 1950, he did his second major paper, the kind of paper that if that was all he did, he would be considered important. And that was computing machinery and intelligence. Let's begin with our intellectual context. The intellectual context in 1931, when Turing went off to King's College, Cambridge, was a very active and energetic look at the intellectual base for mathematics. The idea was we were going to take mathematics, which had all sorts of vague assumptions and ideas that were not clearly stated, and put it on a solid foundation of basic axioms. And from those axioms, you would reason to conclusions through rigorous logical proof. Now, most of you, I know, think that that's what mathematics is. But in fact, it's a form of mathematics that evolved in the late 19th century. In England, the major proponent of it was a pair of mathematicians, Whitehead and Russell, who during the First World War had created a lengthy book trying to do just this, 
that was called Principia Mathematica. The leader of this movement was very much a German mathematician who was named David Hilbert. Hilbert, at the start of the 20th century, put down a very specific program for how we were going to axiomatize mathematics. He wanted to create a formal mathematics that had, among other things, three major properties. One, that it was complete, two, that it was consistent, and three, that it was decidable. By complete, he meant that all true statements of mathematics could be proven true. When he talked about consistency, he meant that there were no contradictions, no pair of true statements that contradicted each other. Finally, he wanted it to be decidable. That meant that you could take any statement in mathematics and determine if it was true or if it was false. This program seemed as if it would provide years of work for mathematicians, but it came to a sudden and very shocking end in 1931, the year that Turing entered college, when Kurt Gödel showed that if mathematics was consistent, it could not be complete. He did this with a pair of self-contradictory statements. There's a lot of machinery around it. The first statement says that the second statement is false. The second statement says that the first statement is true. We cannot possibly make this work in a mathematical framework. We have a contradiction. This theorem produced something of a crisis in mathematics and caused many people to wonder what they were doing. Bertrand Russell, the mathematician who had been working on these ideas, said that it made him glad that he was no longer working at mathematical logic. Many mathematicians got aggressive with him and claimed that that meant he never really understood Gödel's work. And yet, even though there was a crisis, it was an exciting period in math. It pushed people into research that was looking at an increasingly strange landscape and a lot of people were willing to study it. In this crisis, Turing decided to look at the decision problem that is generally known by its German name, the Einstein's problem. This problem is if you are presented with a mathematical statement, you can determine if it's true or false. This at some level seems to be a mechanical problem. You need a machine that can take a statement and provide a mechanical solution. Now, from the intellectual context, let's look at the practical context. The important environment at the time was that of machinery, complex devices, mechanical devices, electrical devices. It was a time when engineering had an excitement about it that we don't see today. It was something that was accelerated by the Great War, particularly in the fields of transportation, air transportation being the most prominent, and communications, radio and telephones. And it brought out, particularly in young men, a great faith that they were going to go off and solve human ills through the application of machinery. Now, these machines had a strong connection to mathematics that stretched back into the 19th century. Already at that time, there were people thinking about machines that could calculate and reckon. We start with Charles Babbage who built a computing engine in 1822, were followed with William Burroughs, who in 1880 built a practical adding machine that was systematically changing banking. And then in 1890, Herman Hollerith produces a punched card machine that ultimately becomes the basis for IBM's great success. But these machines also had a connection to pure mathematics and to the kind of axiomization that David Hilbert was doing. They were represented by the work of George Cantor, who used mythical or mental machines to explore the idea of infinity and try and put it on a more concrete basis. You start with the question of what is infinity, and you get very quickly an entity that's bigger than any other number. You also discover that there are two kinds, countable infinity, the numbers are countable, and uncountable, such as the number of points on a line. But how do you distinguish them, and how do you handle these kinds of infinity? Cantor determined a way of handling it with what he called mental machines. Well, if you look at the machinery of infinity, you start by focusing on the countably infinite sets. The numbers, as I said, are infinite. One, two, three, four, five, 
How many there are are bigger than any individual number. So they're infinite, but they're countable. And to make something countable, you say that you can put a mechanical correspondence between those numbers and the counting numbers. So, for example, how many even numbers are there? Well, they're countably infinite because you can count them. The first even number is 2, the next is 4, the third is 6. How many odd numbers are there? Well, again, there are countably infinite. The first is 1, the second is 3, the third is 5, and so on. And that starts asking questions. If the counting numbers are infinite, and they can be divided into two infinite groups, how many countably infinite groups are there in the countable infinite numbers? Not sure you want to go there, but the answer is countably infinite. Well, from here we go on to other questions. How many points are there on a line? Well, it's more than countably infinite, and to show it you need to show that you can't get any kind of machine or mathematical mapping between the countable integers and the points on the line. But how many fractions are there? That's a good question, because at first glance it could go either way. It might be countable, or it might not. Cantor went on to look at this question by mapping the fractions to the positive integers, and he looked for a machine-like process, something that would mechanically connect those integers to the fractions. And he followed ideas that others were thinking about during the 19th century, the ideas of Charles Babbage, who was very strong about analyzing things. Edward Moobridge, the guy who looked at animal movements and tried to break them apart, as you see in the screen. Or in particular, Paul Nipko, who tried to capture pictures as a collection of zero or one dots. Nipkow's work was highly influential to the late 19th century mathematicians. The idea was that you could take a picture and you could scan it, go across a line, drop down a line, go across, come back, go across, come back, go across. And from those scans, you could stop at every little instance and capture a dot of light, black or white, since that was all they cared about. And then you could take those dots and reproduce the original image. He did this through a spinning disk, and it was a process that very much anticipated the fax machine and anticipated television. Cantor took this idea and applied it to the fractions. He scanned them, counting as he went. But instead of scanning linearly, he did it diagonally. He created a grid. The numbers across the top of the grid would be the numerators of fractions. The numbers down the side of the grid would be the denominators and he would scan on the diagonal, going back and forth, up and down as he went. And in the process, he could create a mapping between the integers and all the fractions that existed. Now, in tackling the Einstein's problem, the decision problem, Turing started with a statement and asked if you could decide if it were true or false. In particular, could you create a machine that would decide if it were true or false? From that work, he came up with the idea of a Turing machine, which is the abstraction of computing machinery. It's something like Cantor's mapping, that it went in a different and much more sophisticated direction. Turing's machine was an abstract idea. It was never actually a machine. But nonetheless, it described something very much like what would ultimately become a computer. His machine started with a tape. The exact nature of the tape was not clear. We quickly make it magnetic tape because that's what we are used to using. But in 1938, that was still a rare concept. The tape was divided into cells, and on each of those cells, you could store a zero or a one, just as you could in a modern computer. In addition to the tape, there was a read-write head, something that could read what was on the tape erase it, and put new material on the tape. There were also state registers, things that described what the computer was thinking, the material it was working on, the data that was currently being processed. And finally, he posited that there would be an instruction table, a list of instructions that was guiding the machine to read and write data, to take information and process it. The idea behind this machine is that Turing used it, in a way similar to the way Cantor used his imaginary machines, to identify undecidable statements.
statements that you could not determine if they were true or false. Now, that proved the decision problem if, and this is a big if, if the Turing machine captures everything that's computable, and that idea has become known as the Church Turing Thesis from 1936, and this idea undergirds much of computation. It's important to note that there were other programming activities going on at roughly the same time that Turing was working on his Turing machines. Programming efforts that seemed to be completely independent of what Turing was doing. One of the early ones took place at Iowa State University, where John at Nassau was trying to get punched card machines to do linear algebra something that was pretty close to impossible with the machines at the time, and at Nassau had to build an extension to a punch card machine, and then ultimately abandoned that effort and built his own machine. At roughly the same time, Howard Aiken at Harvard University was designing a mechanical programming computer that would be called the Mark I. A similar effort was also going on in Germany by Konrad Zuse at roughly the same time. From Turing's work with mathematics and his machines, we now have to go to the context of his work, the context of service, which was, of course, the Second World War. In 1936, Turing goes to Princeton to complete his doctorate in mathematics. There, he meets John von Neumann, who is a mathematician at the Institute for Advanced Study, which at this time shares facilities with Princeton University. Von Neumann at this point is a mathematician who is increasingly becoming interested in computation. His government, von Neumann is in touch with the leading computing group in the United States government, and he also knows mathematicians in England who are interested in computation. Turing finishes his PhD in 1938. He sees, as almost everyone does, that Europe is gearing for a new large-scale war, and he returns to England to serve his country. Returning to England... Turing reports to Bletchley Park, which is the British code-breaking center. It's located roughly halfway between Oxford and Cambridge and drew a lot of talent from both places. The work at Bletchley Park had both aspects of Turing's work. It was fundamentally mathematical, and yet it ultimately required a strong mechanical tool in order to break the German Enigma code. The German Enigma cipher was the major tool of the Third Reich. It used what was called multi-alphabetic substitution. In regular alphabetic substitution, you replace one letter with a different letter. In multi-alphabetic substitution, you replace one letter with another, but your list of substitutions changes. And the Germans did this initially with a set of three rotors, which kept rotating through different substitution lists as the code was being done. The trick was to find the starting position of these rotors. That starting position was changed each day according to rules from the German military. In trying to break the German Enigma code, Turing started with the mathematics and was able to reduce the problem of finding the initial rotor settings. Once they had the limited number of settings, they would put the code through an automated Enigma machine a machine that would decode it, whether they had the right code or not, and count the letters that came out. If the letter frequency in the decoded message more or less matched the common frequency of German, the machine would flag it, and a human being would look at the message to see if indeed it was in German. If it didn't match the German frequencies, the machine would go on to the next setting of the rotor. The machine that did this work was called the bomb. It was a mechanical machine and started operation in March of 1940. It operated effectively until February 1942 when the German Navy upgraded its Enigma. It required more work to crack the code. The British captured a new Enigma in October 1942, which made the work easier. But at that point, they began thinking about how would you build a faster machine? And from that came the Colossus, which is pictured here, which began operations in 1943. It was an all-electronic calculating machine and was a definite positive step towards building an electronic computer. For his work at Bletchley Park, which included both the mathematics and the design of machinery, Turing received the Order of the British Empire from the British government. 
the award was kept secret for a time because of the secret nature of the work. But it was announced to the public within two years, and certainly by the 1950s, most of Turing's peers knew about the award. Now, Turing was not alone as a mathematician volunteering for the war effort. A number of mathematicians on both sides of the Atlantic took military jobs to support the war. The work not only included cryptography, it included statistics, quality control and quality assurance, ballistics, shockwave modeling, bombing strategies, and various forms of management and optimization. It was something that they felt they could do to help the country and also to it help advance their field. The picture here is Oswald Veblen, who was a mathematician in the United States. He volunteered first in the First World War and then became a leader of the mathematical effort of the second. One of Turing's American peers was John Curtis. He served in the U.S. Navy as a mathematician. His role was more statistical. He was deeply involved in quality control and quality assurance. But he had access to all of the U.S. computing projects and wrote a major report in 1945 on the subject of computing machinery. Immediately after the war, he was appointed to be the head of the National Bureau of Standards Applied Mathematics Laboratory, which very quickly became a major computing center both using machines and developing them. One of the items that was noted on his personnel record was that he was unmarried and had never been married. A second peer from the United States was Gertrude Blanche. She served as the director of the Mathematical Tables Project, which was indeed the largest computing organization in the American government during the Second World War. It did computing for every aspect of the war, navigation, radar work, the atomic bomb, ballistics, shockwaves. She was, in fact, the 35th woman in the United States to get a mathematical PhD. Her record also noted that she had never married, and it also noted that her sister was an active member of the Communist Party. Immediately following the war, Turing joined the National Physical Laboratory, which was a new government-owned laboratory. There, he worked on the design of the Pilot Ace, an initial computer to test the ideas of computation. He was assisted by Harry Husky, who was an important person in cross-fertilizing the computer. Husky eventually moved to the National Bureau of Standards, where he designed the SWAC computer. In 1948, Turing moved to Manchester University, where he worked on the Manchester Mark I, a computer that was being developed there. Turing focused primarily on software and quickly developed a simple chess-playing program. Increasingly, he became interested in the field that would come to be known as artificial intelligence and asked the question, what did it mean for a machine to think? He ultimately answered that question with an activity we named after him, the Turing test. The Turing test compares outcomes, doesn't worry about process. The idea is that you have two doors, behind one is a person, behind the other is a computer. And you put questions under the door and get results out. You are free to ask whatever questions you would like. You then compare the results. And if ultimately you cannot determine which door hides the computer and which door hides the person, then you have a thinking machine, according to Turing's test. This result was published in 1950 in what would be the second of Turing's great papers. It was also published at a time when the leadership of scientists was starting to be questioned, certainly in the United States and by transference in England. There were growing doubts about scientific leaders, about their public and private roles. In particular, the question concerned their loyalty. Were they loyal to their country? or to some other power named science, or to another country. The comfortable environment for scientific leadership quickly turned hostile. The fear of communism was behind it in no little degree, but it also included other things that differentiated scientists from the population at large. One of the early victims of this concern was Robert Oppenheimer, who had led the Manhattan Project. In 1953, he was put in front of a board that stripped him of his security clearance because they deemed him untrustworthy. Gertrude Blanche in the United States ran into similar problems at about the same time. In 1953, she was called in front of a loyalty board that questioned her loyalty to the United States. 
On her record was the mark, unmarried, and never known to have had a boyfriend. She probably had more trouble from the fact that she lived with her sister and that her sister was indeed an active communist. She passed out flyers on the street. It was a long hearing for her, but she was ultimately cleared, and the end of her story is positive. She became a senior scientist with the Air Force and was recognized for her service to the government. Next was John Curtis. He was accused of what was called deviance in 1953. He was quite angry with the accusation, I will not live the life of a victim. But it was noted by his friends that he had never married. He seemed very attracted to men and lived a kind of lifestyle that wasn't in keeping with what much of the country thought was a secure lifestyle. He decided to resign his position and for the next 20 years was largely a visiting faculty member at various universities. At roughly the same time, the Bureau of Standards lost its computing lab and computing research moved elsewhere. Turing's story is well known. It is less national, perhaps, and more local. In 1952, Turing reported a break-in, a break-in that was probably caused by the friend of a man with whom Turing had a relationship. He admitted this relationship to the local police, not thinking anything of it. And quickly it turned, and they pressed charges on him for deviance. He had been deeply involved in national service, and this, of course, was presented as part of his defense. But that may have damaged his cause. He may have been identified as someone who was important and hence should be more disciplined. He received an indecency conviction, and as punishment he chose a hormonal treatment rather than going to jail. After struggling with the side effects of the treatment, he apparently committed suicide. In looking at Turing's life, and indeed the life of his peers, we need to ask what these trials and challenges did to them and how they were connected to their lives. Science is by nature a cloistering activity. That is to say, you work in a tight community. It's a meritocracy that values skills, yet you work within that community and you trust your thoughts to those who are in it. At the same time, it's also linked to issues of national security and national identity, which also bring a certain amount of anxiety and concern from the general public. At some level, this is the challenge of innovation. You have to work within this community, and yet that community, which has a wall separating itself from the general public, has to be responsive to that public. In terms of Alan Turing's contributions, again, we see three major themes. The mathematical challenge of his day, the power and excitement of machinery, and the desire to serve in war. This was the environment in which he worked, and he made at least two major contributions, his machines and his test for artificial intelligence. It leaves us with a very important foundation for the computing world. And also it makes us understand that to make those contributions, he lived in a world apart. I hope in the process that I've encouraged you to look at two books. One is Andrew Hodge's great biography of Turing. It was written during the 1980s, just as Turing's reputation was rising. And the book, When Computers Were Human, which describes the role of Gertrude Blanche and others who helped support the American computing effort. This is David Allen Greer. Take care.